All right, we are in Proverbs chapter 30. And we have come to verse 24, four things. There be four things which are little upon the earth, but are exceeding wise. The ants are a people not strong, and yet they prepare their meat in summer. The conies are but a feeble folk, yet they make their houses in the rocks. The locusts have no king, and yet go they forth all of them by bands. The spider takes hold with her hands and is in king's palaces. Father, we thank you again as we enter into your word. We are thankful for your word that has been preserved to us. Every word of God is pure, purified in a furnace seven times. It is the lamp for our feet, the light for our path. It is our sanctification. We pray, Father, that you would take your word now and cause us to hear Pray that you would quiet our hearts before it. We are grateful, O oh Father, for the wisdom given to Solomon, given to Agur for us to learn from and to grow in in our own personal walk with you uh, for this life here upon the earth as we journey toward eternal glory. We pray, Father, that you would make us wise unto salvation and uh, that we would in all of our ways be pleasing to thee. We pray in the name of Christ our Lord, amen. Four things. So we have little but wise. <clears throat> little but wise. And uh, in the first one, the ants and the conies, weak but wise. And we have also the locusts and the spiders. So we have... Uh, a number of very small creatures along with the conies. And what we see is in these four, there's wisdom, <clears throat> wisdom in preparation for the ants, wisdom in protection for the conies or the hydrax, wisdom in initiative and working in numbers for the locusts, wisdom in sustaining and advancing by skill in the spider. I want us to think and draw from these uh, the wisdom that, that God has given here. Certainly God has given wisdom to his creatures. It is for them instinct, intuitive to their, their particular creaturehood. I was reading on the ants today in preparation for some of my books, and they were talking about um, the intelligence of the creatures. And in the older books, uh, we're talking about the fact that it is instinct, and yet even with instinct, if the, if the creatures live long enough upon the earth, they can actually learn things in their own sphere as well. They can't reason like men, but, uh, but God has made them wise in different ways and has made them an example for us. And God is always the God of the little guy. He's, always, he's the God who stacks all the odds against himself uh, he is not many noble, not many wise. God's people are often the poor of the earth. And, uh, that, and that God has made the wisdom of this world foolish and that which appears to be the strongest in this world. Uh, oftentimes God takes the small, the insignificant uh, in order to teach us and instruct us. And in, in humility, we ought to learn from them. Verse 24 says there are four things which are little upon the earth, diminutive, but are exceeding wise. The first, the ant. Uh, ants are easily killed, we know that, uh, beneath our feet. Um, but their industry is indefatigable. I love that word, I just can't pronounce it usually. Indefatigable, they're just amazing creatures. And of course, we read previous to this, early on in our study, go to the ants in Proverbs 6.6. 6. Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provides her meat in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. How long will you sleep, O sluggard? When will you arise out of your sleep? 
He had a little sleep and a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, and so shall thy poverty come as one that travails and thy want as an armed man. So we've already been instructed by Solomon concerning the ant, and now Agur. And both of them tell us to look to the ant, and God's creatures have been an encouragement to us. Here, Agur says in verse 25 that the ants are a people not strong, and yet they prepare their food in summer. So they are wise in that they perform these functions that they are created for. They're not strong. What does that mean? Well, for their own size, you know, we can look at the, the engineering of it for their own size. And after a variety of studies, it was found that a field ant's neck could hold 5,000 times the ant's weight. So that's pretty good. But when it says they're not strong, what he's talking about is the fact that they are such a tiny creature and they're killed so easily. So they're diminutive. They can be eaten by predators, but their industry is incredible. They prepare their, their food for the summer. So this is the particular lesson that Agur is teaching us. Solomon's already taught us some of this before and some other lessons, but this lesson is they're small, but they prepare their food in the summer. They make hay while the sun shines. They're opportunistic in the very best sense of the word. Summer is a time of plenty, and summer is the most clement weather. So it's the right time to do things, and it's the right time to get things done. And of course, we relate this to ourselves. Do we make hay while the sun shines? Are we opportunistic in the very best sense of the word? There are times in our lives and uh, various times that God gives to us where it's time to act. It's time to do something. Strike while the iron, while the iron is hot. You know, all these idiomatic statements that are, they're talking about what Agur is talking about here. Do we make hay while the sun shines? How do ants prepare their food in summer? Well, they do it through organization, they do it through efficiency, they do it through a superior, superb work ethic. Uh, they have, at times, massive underground uh, dwellings. Some of them are seven feet deep, which is why even though we think we've got them after we poured the gas down there and lit it, if some people are brave enough to light it, uh, you still haven't touched most of that mound. You've just gotten the surface of it. But they have storage rooms deep underground they have storage rooms where they put their trash that eventually comes up to the surface. They have a throne room for the queen. They have rooms for nurturing the babies. They have warm dry rooms, warm damp rooms, cool dry rooms, cool damp rooms, and they have nursing ants that bring them to whichever room is necessary and continually moving them around to make sure that they get the most possible productivity out of the eggs that they have and uh, bringing forth more ants to the work. This is preparation for the future. This is preparation for the future. And it takes work, and it's constant work. They make hay while the sun shines. There, there is a time to work. We sang the hymn and the broadman, work for the night is coming. There's a time to work. That time is now. That time is when you're young. That time is sometimes when you're old too, if God grants you strength to it. They store up food for the winter, dead insects, grass seeds, grain. Some of them they have even found that as they plant the seeds and various things in their storage rooms, some ants they will find have, and they don't know, you know the argument over whether it's from their, from their experience or whether it just happens, but seeds from certain grasses, they'll have growing near to the ant mound after a while, whether it's excess seeds that they put there mistakenly or whether they have learned that they can produce their own some ants have millers that actually take the grain and turn it into flour. There's the mushroom ants. The mushroom ants take cuttings from the leaves, they chew them up, they plaster these rooms full of this secretion after they have eaten the leaves, and then they grow mushrooms under the ground that only grow for these ants. And it's the only person that uses these mushrooms or these ants. 
and they continually harvest these and don't allow them to grow large. They just continue to pick them off as the spores come up. And they go to all this work in order to provide for themselves and for the colony. They have paths that go back and forth to the mound. They keep the path immaculately clean. And the reason they keep it immaculately clean is for efficiency, so that the worker ants that are coming in aren't tripping over things. So that would help some of us. It would help me in my study, actually, at the present time, to be a little more efficient with what I'm doing. Each ant does its job, laying eggs, nurturing young, feeding the queen, fighting, storing up food. Some act, ants act as cattle keepers. They herd aphids and other insects that secrete for them sweet substances, and they milk these insects and protect them. Their, their benefit is that they protect the aphid and other insects, and they provide these secretions for them. But they are ever and always preparing for the future and always preparing for winter. They have to feed themselves in summer, but they're not only feeding themselves in summer, but they're also laying up store for those times when they can't provide so well. And I think about the story of George Whitfield in his early days as a ministerial candidate. He would spend hours and hours and hours on his knees studying his Greek New Testament along with Matthew Henry. And his goal was to learn every single passage in the scriptures and its spiritual application. And that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to understand everything. And he could open up the Bible in any place and understand it. And all that labor that he did as a young man, and before he had a wife, uh, he used that later on in life when the winter came. His health was down. He was preaching sometimes seven, eight, ten times a week over in the colonies and other places in his evangelistic uh, travels, but he had this store. He had this store that he had already stored up while he was young and had the time and had the energy and had the ability to go long hours with the books, uh, which later on paid off for him. As Christians, we are called to prepare for winter, to be wise. If the ants are wise, we certainly should be wise as rational creatures. Uh, we prepare our children for the winter is coming. We will sleep the sleep of death. Our children will not have us. We only have our children for a time in our homes, and they only have us for a certain amount of time as well upon the earth. And so while we have them, we try to prepare them and try to feed into them uh, the truth of God and prepare them for life itself. We train up deacons, we train up ministers and teachers because the winter is coming and one by one the old guard dies off. And as the old guard is dying off, there has to be those who come in their place and continue to preach and practice sound doctrine in the churches. Do we make hay while the sun shines? So while children are in their formative years, we are preparing them. And while you young people are in your youth and have the strength of your youth, you are to be using the strength of your youth to be able to study and work and labor. Are you working hard? Are you studying diligently? Are you storing up scripture verses in your mind? Are you storing up Bible knowledge? Are you filling up notebooks with notes on the different books of the Bible so that you can know what's in each book of the Bible so that one day you could teach your own family the books of the Bible so that you can understand whether you're at a sound church or not. Before you have children or a spouse and a bunch of little ones running around that take time and energy away from you and you don't have all the time and energy that you had at one time, it's time for you to prepare. Get ready for winter. Get ready for more difficult times, more stresses and strains. Are we making wise decisions storing up for winter years? Or do we waste the precious time of summer? Summer is a time of plenty. It's the best weather. Work for the night is coming when men work no more. The second creature that Agar talks about there's wisdom in preparation for the ants, and then there's wisdom in protection. The coney 
in the Old King James, some of your translations may say the rock badger. It is the Syrian hydrax, hyrax, H-Y-R-A-X. You can look it up. In the uh, International Bible uh, Encyclopedia, the Syrian hyrax lives in Syria, Palestine, and Arabia. A number of other species, including several that are arboreal, live in Africa. They're not found in other parts of the world. In size, teeth, and habits, the Syrian hyrax somewhat resemble the rabbit, though it's different in color. Reddish brown, lacks the long hind legs. The similarity in dentition is confined to just the large size of the front teeth. Well, our scripture text calls them feeble folk, and they are feeble. They are feeble. If you see pictures of them or have ever seen them on uh, shows that deal with different animals, you'll see them lounging out in the sun. You'll see them coming out of the rocks, and then they lay out in the sun to get their metabolism going because their metabolism is so slow, or they pile up on top of each other oftentimes. From the African Wildlife Foundation, they write, the rock hyraxes do not dig burrows. They live in colonies of 50 or so in natural crevices of rocks or boulders, and they regularly use latrines in the areas they inhabit conspicuous white deposits. They are active in the daytime and can be seen feeding or sunning themselves near the entrance to their shelters. Rock hyraxes spend several hours sunbathing in the morning, followed by short excursions to feed. They eat quickly with the family group, facing out from a circle to watch for potential predators. Feeding on grasses, herbage, leaves, fruit, insects, lizards, birds, eggs. After biting off a mouthful of grass, the hyrax looks up and cautiously checks the vicinity. If the territorial male gives the shrill shriek of alarm, the hyraxes jump or scuttle to cover while they remain frozen without moving till the danger has passed. They spend much of their time in that way. Hyraxes are preyed upon by leopards, pythons, large birds, carcals, servals, civets. They protect themselves from smaller predators by biting, but to escape to hiding places among the rocks is their best defense. So, you know, the picture is these are a feeble folk. They, they cannot fight much of anything. So even while they're eating, they're watching so that they can scurry back to the rock at any moment uh, because they are weak. They are wise. They're wise because they know they're feeble. They know what they are. There's nothing wrong with knowing what you are. And they make provision then for that protection. They, they stay near the rock fortress to jump into it whenever they need it. And of course, David, the great King David, understood this as well. In Psalm 6 and 2, have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. Heal me. My bones are vexed. And we see David oftentimes speaking of his weakness and bemoaning it and saying, I need your help, O Lord. We need to understand our weakness. We need to understand how feeble we are. We are the pinnacle of creation. We are made in the image of God. We are rational creatures, reasonable creatures, but we have fallen. And having fallen in Adam, we have a great weakness in many ways. And therefore, we should understand that. Christ said to his disciples, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, the flesh is weak. You need to know what you are, and what you are is weak. Your flesh is weak. The spirit is willing, it wants to do, and it wants to do right as a Christian, but we need to understand that we still have within us this weakness which can trip us up, and if we overestimate ourselves, may find ourselves in trouble. Uh, Peter overestimated his, himself as far as his ability to overcome temptation under a tough situation, and he fell. We are weak in many ways, but not in our faith in Christ. In that, we are strong. That's the fortress. That's what we go out, go back to and hide in. 1 Corinthians 1.27, But God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of this world to confound the things which are mighty. The believers know that they are weak. The believers understand their weakness, 
spiritual weakness, but they find great strength in, in their object of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and in the power of the Spirit of God. Sin makes us weak and vulnerable. In 1 Corinthians 11:30, when they had uh, sinned against the Lord in the communion services, it says, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you. So, in order to strengthen ourselves, we have to feed upon God's word. The Bible keeps us from sin or sin keeps us from the Bible. Our trials that we have make us feel our weakness and then we turn to our rock. 2 Corinthians 12.10, therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, weaknesses, reproaches, necessities, persecutions, distresses for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. And what he simply means is that when I understand my weakness, when I see my weakness, when I feel my weakness, that's when I'm the strongest because then I finally flee to the shelter and I don't have this spiritual arrogance thinking that I can do on my own or by myself. So that the rock is there in Christ. Psalm 18.2, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God and my strength in whom I will trust. Psalm 71.3, be thou my strong habitation whereunto I may continually resort like the conies who sit there, they eat, and then they, after taking a bite of food, they look up, is there something here that's going to kill me? And then they take another bite of food. That's a good example for us as we go through this life. We do a duty and then we look up to God. Lord, protect us from all our enemies about, principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness in high places, and then we go back. So this, this continual understanding of their weakness and this continual staying near to the rock is a great example for us that we need to be wise. We need to be wise like the ants in that we make hay while the sun shines our preparation we need to be wise like the conies in the way that they protect themselves, that we protect ourselves in God. The third is the locusts. The locusts have no king, yet they all advance in ranks. So we see with the locusts there is initiative and there is working in numbers. For them, they go forward without a king, the text says. They have no king, but they still advance. So there is here... Uh, like the ant in which is said that having no guide or overseer or ruler provides. Here we have the locusts have no king, but they still advance. They're called, they're called an army in Joel 2.25 when God says the great army which I send unto you. And God has used that particular army at times as a punishment upon different lands. But they are, they're wise that they go in numbers because there's power in numbers and there's power in unity and in agreement. And I think there's a, there is a, a good example there for us. They're little, but there's a lot of them and they labor together and they work together and the church of the Lord Jesus Christ needs to learn from that as well and be wise in that way that we gather together under a banner, under the essentials of the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ and that while there may be differences among us on non-essentials. We need to understand that there is power in unity, the unity of the essentials of the faith, and as we go forward, that we go forward in that agreement. Blessed power when the agreement is sound doctrine. In the days of revival, and we've been, we're gonna get to a study eventually on revival that we've been working on, but in those days, what you often see among the churches there were churches of various denominations. They were sound in doctrine, though they had some differences among themselves. Perhaps it was in ecclesiology and some other things. But what you find in times of revival, when there's an unusual work of the Spirit of God, a lot of conversions going on, a lot of believers being awakened to their own duties in the faith and their love for God, you find a greater unity always in those stories and in those epics of the church history. You find a greater unity among the churches as they come together under the great essentials of the faith and labor for the Lord. But it's not just wisdom and numbers. What I see also with these, because the text says that they have no king, they have no king. So I see initiative there that I think believers should have. They don't have somebody driving them. They don't have a king. 
and they don't need someone to tell them what to do each step of the way. We saw this initiative in 1 Samuel with Jonathan as opposed to Saul. Saul, who is sitting in the camp, uh, idle, and Jonathan is going forth to war against the Philistines. He's taking initiative because, like David, his friend later on would say, is there not a cause? We see it in David facing Goliath and the rest of the army then following after him. Matthew Henry writes, it is not any inconvenience to them that they have no king. They are called God's great army for when he pleases, he busters, marshals them, and wages war by them as he did in Egypt. And Christians are like that in the, in the, in the bigger picture. Christians throughout the world have no apparent, no visible king because we serve the invisible God. And so to the world, they look upon Christians, but what do they see? Well, what they do see among evangelical Christians all across the world is that they serve this invisible God, just like the locusts who have no king, but God is their king, obviously. He calls them to war. So Christians all across the globe obey the Lord. They go preaching the gospel. They go living holy lives. They go forth to war. They don't have to have somebody slaving over them to tell them what to do because the Lord is their king. Pastors are called to instruct the congregation, but I shouldn't have to lash a whip over anybody because if God is your king, you should have the initiative to holiness and to labor for the Lord. Now, obviously, there's encouragement from the pulpit, and there's supposed to be. It's the call of the ministry to do that. But there's initiative here, initiative. Each believer following the dictates of Scripture and the powerful leading of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness and then led into his ministry. Romans 8, 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So there is this indwelling spirit who powerfully leads us so that the Christian of all people should be, a pers should be persons of initiative. They should take initiative. They should be the people at jobs that take initiative because they, they are, though they serve earthly masters and bosses, they ultimately serve the Lord God. So whether you're a slave or a master, the Christian always stood out because they took the initiative to do the best job and to go forward with things. They didn't have to be drug along. They should not have to be drug along. So there's wisdom there as we see the locusts who go forth without a king and they go forth in their numbers, unified in what they're doing. And then lastly, we have the instance of the spider. The spider skillfully grasps with its hands and is in king's palaces. And uh, I was reading some commentaries and I just had to quit after a while. They were talking about the people that complain about the scriptures and, well, the spider doesn't have any hands, yada, yada, yada. Well... This is the way all literature speaks of the animal kingdom when it's dealing with characteristics of them. When compared, and the spider is, a, is an amazing creature. Here, what Agur seems to be focusing upon is the skill of the spider, the skill. The spider skillfully grasps with his hands. And I have, you, everyone here has been amazed by spiders at different times, especially if you got providentially caught in their web for a moment and tried to get the sticky stuff off. Or if you've ever had one of these blowers where you're blowing off the sidewalk and then you see a spider sack up there on the house and you aim your blower at it and the spider sack just does this and does this and it will not come off. And then you get within this far like a tornado on it and it's still sticking to the thing. It's just amazing. When compared to weight to strength basis, the spider web strings are five times stronger than steel. The silk of the spider is extremely lightweight and can stretch up to 35 to 40% without breaking. Some types of spider silk are stronger than Kevlar. 
the material used to make bulletproof vests. The Darwin's bark spider is able to produce silk that's twice the strength of any other spider silk and more than 10 times stronger than Kevlar. On the Terminex website, which was an interesting, where you can get some of the best information is either people that are trying to get rid of pests because they study them, or people that are trapping animals because they study their habits. They write that investigators have developed synthetic spider silk based bandages containing antibiotic properties. Silk proteins are being engineered for use in many applications, including bone tissue engineering and nerve regeneration. Silk proteins are desirable for these applications due to the reduced immune response and biodegradable properties. The physical properties of spider silk make it useful for building the framework for structures that may be used in medical applications. The spider works out of sight if he can. Sometimes he's in sight, but for the most part, he's off to the edge. The spider does not care where he works. Now, our text emphasizes that you find him even in the king's palace, but he doesn't care if he's in the meter box or the king's palace. He works out of sight. And any of you who have ever, when I came to Alabama, I learned that before you put your hand down in the meter box, you checked for the black widows. He works one thing, and he works it well. He spins. He works that one thing over and over and over again. His work is utilitarian. It provides daily food, but there's also beauty to it as well. Maybe not quite as ingenious as Charlotte's Web with words in it like terrific pig, but the spider web is a beautiful creation. But he does what he's created to do. I fear at times today that we get pumped up. We, everybody talks about dreaming big and you have to have a global product or you gotta have a video that goes viral, which is why people do a lot of stupid things to get themselves in trouble because they're trying to have this national or global notoriety. And people think they have to have this before they can be content the lust for notoriety, the need to be important. The spider does one thing, and he does it again and again and again, and he does it well with skill. There were many judges in Israel. There was only one Moses. Everybody wants to be a Moses, but there were thousands of other judges in Israel that had work to do, and it was all important. Franz Mohr, our buddy, he had one tool, he had a tuning fork. And with that tuning fork, he produced some of the best tuned pianos for Rubenstein and for some of the greatest pianists around the world with that one tool. We are to find our skills, find our callings, hone our skills, be faithful with our skills, and then use that skill over and over and over again for the good of mankind and the glory of God. And be happy that God has granted us that skill. If we are faithful to God in the discharge of the skill that he has given us, or skills, then we should be content to live in a hut or a palace. And so it has been for believers all over the world who have found their peace and their joy, who like the spider, they skillfully grasped with their hands something that God gave them to do. And some of them found themselves in king's palaces and some of them found themselves in huts. But all of them found that they were content and at peace because God had granted them this, but they labored diligently at it, even if it's just that one thing. And that's okay. There'll always be some people that will do multiple things, but most people do one thing primarily in their lives, and that's okay. So these little creatures, they're small, but very wise, and they give us instruction in these things. So may God help us to, to make hay while the sun shines. Let's labor and work, prepare for winter days, 
Some of us are already in winter, as you can see, but we're still working and still preparing for a later day. Let us be wise in our protection. Know that you're weak and feeble and that you need to stay near to the rock at all times. Be wise in having initiative. Take the initiative to do work with others with a unity and grace and wisdom in sustaining and advancing oneself by the skill that God has given to you. And, the, and by these things, these little creatures uh, can teach us. And as Christians, Christians should be able to be taught by anybody and anything in God's world because we have been humbled by the Lord and we recognize the divine stamp upon everything within the creation as well. And so we rejoice in it as we, as we look at these things. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these instructions. Pray that you would help us, Lord, with each and any of these things, Lord, in which we need to pay attention to, uh, that you would make us uh, wise as the highest of your creation, that we would be wise in you, that we would imitate uh, these things in our own lives. I pray, Father, for your blessing upon each one, that you would take the specific lessons that are given to us here within the text, that you would apply it uh, in a very practical way uh, to the, the lives that are before me here by your good providence. And Lord, that, that it would not just be uh, a sermon that was, was heard and uh, interesting, but it would be one that is applied. And uh, Father, so that we can continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and grow in our usefulness before thee. And we pray these things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.